According to your will According to your will My life is not my own Well, hi, and welcome to our Bible study here at Bible Talk, where we are continuing on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, just beginning. Uh, last week was our, our first part, the introduction. So we'll, we'll be going into that. And this is an in-depth study of the Word of God. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is the most radical, relevant sermon ever preached. It was preached by Jesus Christ, the most comprehensive and longest sermon he ever preached. And it is about our lives today, not just about our church life. It is about everything in our lives. So it's really important, and again, I, I suggest two things. That, uh, if, you, if it's possible for you to take notes, uh, mail us any questions you have, any questions, any comments, any suggestions, at office at BibleTalk.com. And remember to check the things that I say in the Word of God. Don't take my word for anything. Test it against the Word. Be like a Berean. Be like the Bereans. More noble-minded than. So, uh, before we start, let me just ask the Lord, Father, to bless our time together tonight. Bless our time in Your Word, Lord God. Your Word, which has the power to change us to mold us into exactly what you desire us to be. Lord, that we would continue to grow in you, growing nearer and nearer to you, being more and more like your Son, Christ Jesus. So use this time in our lives this evening and open the ears, the eyes of our heart, Lord God, that we would hear and see wonderful things in your word. I ask that, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, as I said, we're, we're continuing on in our study. We will be posting these up as we do them every week. They're always available on demand. You can go back and, and review them, see them again, or invite others to come and take part in it. And I, I would be blessed if you would do that if you are blessed by the studies. All right, before we start, um, we, we, let me, I will get to where we left off. But I just wanted to share a couple of incidents in my life that are relevant to what we're teaching tonight. Uh, back back in the mid seventies, late seventies, I get when mid seventies, I was asked for the first time to preach in front of a, a large group of people, people that I did not know. Uh, whereas you know, prior to that, had been in settings where I knew the people and they knew me, and this being the first kind of quote unquote public sermon that I was preaching. I diligently prepared for it. I sat down and I studied and I wrote a sermon all out and I went through it over and over and over. And that Sunday morning, I got up to go and deliver this sermon, preach this sermon. And I was in the shower and as I was in the shower, I was just really joy filled. Mm -hmm. And I was just so happy and so blessed and just so feeling the presence of God when it was as though I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, are you happy? And I said, oh, yes, Lord. And he said, go tell the people why. Well, that wasn't the sermon I had prepared. So all that work was, ching, down the tubes. God told me to go speak something else. And I went that morning. I spoke, I think, in front of about 250 uh, people. And I shared with them why I had the joy that I had in the Lord. And it was a real blessing. But I came away with a great lesson, and that was that while having been a Boy Scout and uh, having learned to be prepared, always be prepared. Always be prepared is to be far more important. Right. And another incident that relates to that was back in the late 90s, Alice and I were traveling. We were out in California, and we were first in Southern California and then going up to Northern California to preach there. And while in Southern California, we stayed with Alice's brother, my brother-in-law and our sister-in-law, in, -law, in uh, Orange County, down in Elisa Viejo. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, there was a really, really bad, l literally an epidemic flu. of flu that was going on. It was so bad at the time that you, there, was, there was nobody in the area, in, from Los Angeles down through southern uh, Orange County, that had any over-the-counter for, uh, medicines for, for this flu. That's how bad it was. And it made headlines. Oh, it was making headlines around the country, yes, because it was so bad. And 
where we were staying with, with my brother-in-law, it sounded like a hospital ward. I mean, everybody had this flu, cough, 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 cough. Uh, other than Al's and I, we, we were unaffected by this flu. We spent our time there, and we left, and we drove up to San Francisco and into the Bay Area and over to Modesto, and I was preaching, to, to pre I was to preach over in a church in Modesto, California, and we stayed at the pastor's house, and as we laid down to go to sleep that Saturday night, I, I laid down, and as soon as I did, I started coughing. And it was just like, all of a sudden, it was almost instantaneous, this attack came on me. And I was hacking and coughing. And so I got up out of the bed, I didn't want to keep Alice awake. And I went into the living room. And I began to pray and, and study the Word. And uh, Well, the upshot was, I couldn't sleep at all that night. I stayed up the entire night. And I'm utterly convinced that it was, the, it was that old enemy, that old devil, that wanted me... Stupid overtired, just worn out and wasted by the time I got to preach at this church. But you know, in Genesis chapter 50, it says what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good. The prophet Isaiah said to the enemy, he said, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. That's in Isaiah 8. And then, of course, you know, Paul said that we know that God works all things together for good for us, right? Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, 28. Yeah. So I did. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night. So by the time I got to the services, first of all, I will tell you, I felt great by the time I got to the church. And the second thing was, boy, was I prayed up. And the result of that was a sermon that has actually come to be known as the attitude of the righteous that I have now preached literally around the world. Not only have I preached that around the world, but in every place where I have preached it, I've had pastors come up to me and ask me if, if they could then turn around and share that same message. So that message is being preached around the world, and it was the result of a night in prayer. Now, the reason I say that, and the reason that it is relevant to what we're talking about, is... We're talking about, we're studying, really just getting into the Sermon on the Mount. And if you ask people, okay, go into your Bible, and the, and the Sermon on the Mount is recounted basically in two places, and we're looking at it from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and in Luke chapter 6, and it goes into chapter 7 a little bit. So if you ask somebody, where does the Sermon on the Mount start? I mean, they may say Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, or they might say, you know, it's like uh, here in the Gospel of Luke, it's... Luke chapter 6 verse 20. But the fact of the matter is, I want to let you know where the Sermon on the Mount actually starts. And you can read this in Luke chapter 6 verse 12. It was at this time that he, Jesus, went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Before Jesus delivered this powerful, radical, revolutionary sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he spent a night in prayer with the Father. You want to know why? That's easy if you understand what he spoke in John chapter 12, verses 48 through 50. Because this is what Jesus said there. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life, therefore the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Jesus went to hear the sermon and discuss the sermon with the Father before he preached the sermon. Now, we, last week we talked a lot in the introduction to this uh, about things being relevant. Right? And, it's, and here's something that's relevant to this. And I say this with, with all love, not, not judgment, to my friends, my brothers and sisters, to pastors and preachers and teachers out there. Oh yeah, I'm not saying you should never be prepared. 
But that is far less important than being pre-prayed. And there is a trend, a movement, a, a, a thing going on in the church that I have encountered, and it shocked me when I first encountered it, but I've encountered it more and more frequently as we travel around the churches around the world. So getting ready for this study, preparing, yeah. I went and I did a Google search, and I put in a term, purchase a sermon. Oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. And when I put in Google, when I Googled purchase a sermon, <laughs> it returned 10,200,000 results. I find more and more pastors, they don't spend a night in prayer before they preach. They go on the internet, spend a few minutes and buy a sermon and come out and then share, preach that sermon. They spend the time with Google. And so, say, yeah, God. you want to talk about, well, you want to talk about relevant. Well, they're, they're, they're sharing with people what somebody else has heard from God rather than what they have heard from God. And therein lies the danger. You know, when Jesus said, and call his bond servants to count the cost. That's in Luke fourteen twenty six. All right. Now, now you know. You can buy a sermon for four dollars ninety five cents and save hours and hours and hours of prayer. That's is that the cost? It's not good to get the word second hand. Now, wh what am I saying? First of all, you're listening to me, and it, by the way, I take this very serious because. The Word of God, James says, Let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur stricter judgment. I, I will, over the course of this coming hour, share with you a lot of Scripture, and I will share with you what God has put in my heart, and what I have gone and prayed about and heard from Him. But when we're all through and we're all done, and the, you, know, you, you click off this website, you need to go talk to the Lord. You need to talk to the Father. You need to talk to Jesus Christ about what we have shared here. Because you need to hear from Him. Faith, without which you cannot please God, comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You need to hear from the Lord. I've had a lot of these pastors. And we, you know, I've preached the gospel on five different continents. I've had a lot of pastors come up to me after I've preached and they say, Oh, can I, can I use that? Can I share that? I say, What, are you kidding me? I plagiarize everything I say. And, and people get shocked. What do you mean you plagiarize it? I don't want to say anything new. But I, you know, may everything that I say have been said before by Jesus Christ or Paul or Peter or John or James. I'm not looking to come. Listen, you know, I, I, I pray that God will use me to bring understanding and clarity and stir things up in your mind, your heart, and your spirit. But I'm not looking to find something new. I'm satisfied with this Word of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We need to learn to be pre-prayer for every situation. People in the world who have been incredibly prepared, prepared for their retirements, prepared for, you know what? The world has collapsed around them. You need to be pre-prayer. You need to be hearing from God about your life, your situation, and you need to be getting it from the Word of God. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. I want to talk now about the Sermon on the Mount. I want to talk about the quote-unquote, the audience, who he spoke this to, right? The first thing you see is that he chooses a, the apostles from among the disciples. Jesus, at this point in time, and remember I said this is fairly early on in his public ministry, but he has disciples that are following him, and from those disciples he now chooses Twelve from among them, the apostles. So at the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sure, listen, if you're here in the United States of America, you, you've probably seen somewhere pictures or movies of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preaching, and he's standing on a hill, and there are, well, thousands, thousands of people standing around listening to him, and there may very well have been. But first of all, he was sitting down, that's what the Word of God says. And second of all, what it says is that he was speaking to disciples. his disciples. So you have there at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to his apostles, his disciples, and to the throngs, to the masses. In Luke 6, again, I'll go back over to that, it says, 
Jesus came down and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples, and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. All right? Luke 16, 17, Luke 6, 17 and 18. So he was teaching the disciples. But you, you have this, I want you to picture this now. Because in this great masses of people, it can be broken down into basically his disciples and the throngs, the masses. Right? But he was teaching the disciples. It says in Matthew 5, right at the beginning of this, in verse 1 and 2, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying. He's teaching his disciples. At the end of this, in the Gospel of Luke, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, listen to these words. It says in Luke 7, this is Luke 7, 1 and 2. He said, when he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people. All right? So he was speaking to, in the hearing of the people. Other people were allowed to listen in. But disciples are the ones who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior. All right? Those are the ones he is speaking to, but others are there listening in. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says, When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. So, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says that the people who were there, listening in, all right, the crowds, this is the throngs, not the disciples, they're amazed that he is teaching and speaking with authority. The apostles and the disciples, they weren't amazed. Why? Because by definition, being disciples, they had recognized his authority already. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The disciples are not amazed by no. his authority there, but the crowds standing around are because they have yet, they don't recognize his authority. All right? They haven't spent time with him. They haven't spent. So the, the question is, okay, are you, are you telling me that the Word of God is, is, he's only speaking it to those who already believe? Well, He's speaking and he's teaching those who already believe. And he's letting other people listen in. Now let me just go a little bit further here. After the, the single most important parable in the Bible, as Jesus claimed it to be, is the parable of the sower and the seed. Right? And in Mark 4, which is where that's recorded, Mark 4, 10 and 11, I want to read. It says, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, again, that's the, the disciples and the, the apostles, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. And then in Luke, it says, and turning his gates towards his disciples, he began to say, blessed are you who are poor. So he's speaking again to the disciples. The word, listen to what I'm going to say carefully and prayerfully, please. The word of God for the saved is this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For the saved, all scripture, Paul wrote to Timothy, all scripture is inspired, God breathed, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So the word of God, the teaching, the preaching to the saved, continues to teach them, to train them, cor correct them, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. To the unsaved, in that same chapter, Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, the sacred writings, scripture, which are able to give you wisdom, that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Within the church today, a lot of time and effort is being spent, misspent, preaching and teaching to unsaved people 
as if they were saved. Trying to train them in the ways of life when that's not what it's about. They are untrainable until they are saved. They're, they're in the old self. The old the old self. And it says, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and says, the natural man does not, cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually appraised. So, you know, you can, you can accumulate and call in these masses of unsaved people and, and preach lovely, lovely sermon. It's never going to train them in anything. What its purpose is, is to lead them to salvation. Because Paul, because as Peter wrote, God desires none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. And it is the Word of God that has that power. So what we need to be preaching to the unsaved is the saving work of Jesus Christ. Not how to be wealthier, healthier, wiser, cuter, more successful on your... That's not what the purpose of the Word of God is for the unsaved. All right. So from there, let's get into the Sermon on the Mount. All right? It starts with this. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, before I can go on, I have to say this. I, I have talked a lot about bad translations. I'm not just talking about... I'm talking about bad translations. And one of the really bad translations... Now remember, it's saying, he's, he's talking to his disciples, he's teaching his disciples, right? And it says he began to teach them, saying, right? In another, in the message book thingy, it says, this is the same verse. You're not going to, i got to tell you it's the same verse, otherwise, because You're here it's talking about, it. he taught his disciples. In the message it says, and he taught his climbing companions. And, and this is... <laughs> I almost spit out my tea. <laughs> I bet you didn't know that you were a climbing a climbing companion. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was bad enough in, in that message thingy that all of a sudden disciples discipleship became mentoring. And now disciples become climbing companions. I am going to share this, and I, I will tell you that as we do this, it is Friday the 13th, 2011, and I... Back up the tape. It is Friday the 13th, 2012. And today on our Bible Talk web page, I, I put up something uh, that many of you may have already seen on the front page news, and that is uh, Wycliffe... Bible translators, which I consider, I've always considered, one of the most faithful Bible translating groups ever yes. in history. They have now worked with a couple other groups, and they have put out translations and uh, that are designed to be more acceptable and less offensive to Muslims. And in those translations, they have removed the, the word, they have, they're not calling God the Father, Father. They have removed the term Son in reference to Jesus Christ, and they have removed the term Son of God, because that will be more acceptable, more, uh, you know, more understandable to Muslims. It is a sad, sad day for me, because the fact of the matter is, and if you, as a matter of fact, right now, if you were to go to the Bible Talk front page, you can see my response to them. And the, the fact is, this has to happen in the last days. Jeremiah, ever so long ago, God spoke to Jeremiah and said, Beware the lying pen of the scribes. There comes a time when, because, as Paul wrote to Timothy, men will not endure sound doctrine, the Word of God is being changed and perverted. It's sad, but true. And it's why you need to put the Word into you, treasure it in your heart, and, and test what's going on. All right. The Beatitudes. Let me read all of them. It's quick enough to run through them first before we start. And I'm, I'm reading from the New American Standard from Matthew 5, starting at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So over and over and over, I know one megachurch pastor has called these the be happy attitudes. Mm. Well, that sounds very cute. It's, it's, but then the question becomes, and as a matter of fact, uh, there are a lot of places, I'm, I'm not sure about in the King James Bible how to translate this, um, but it may say happy. The King James uses the word happy a lot. Right? But there is a difference between, and this is subtle, and I mean, you may not even find this in, in studying a dictionary, but I want to just talk about this a moment. There is a difference between being blessed and being happy. Right? There's a difference between being filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and being happy. Now, to go into this, and I, I won't spend a lot of time in it, but it really is important, if this is going to be relevant to our lives, in this world today, in the year 2012, we need to begin to understand these things. Uh, I'm in America, so I'm going to talk about America for a moment. But I'll talk, first of all, about an Englishman, an Englishman whose name was John Locke. John Locke was actually a doctor, and he was a philosopher in England. Uh, he, was, he was known as the father of liberalism. He died in 1704. Now, he had been regarded as one of the most influential Enlightenment thinkers. And he had incredible influence on the American revolutionaries, the Founding Fathers, many of the Founding Fathers. Thomas Jefferson called Locke, along with Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton. Listen to this. Now, this is a direct quote. Thomas Jefferson called him the three greatest men that have ever lived without exception. Wow. Now, if you, like me, think that words are important, and you think about that, that these men of the Enlightenment are the greatest men of all, greatest men, the greatest thinkers, the greatest teachers of all time, without exception, where does that leave Jesus Christ in the minds of these founding fathers? Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Okay? Locke wrote in, in 1689 that politics or, or governments, uh, civil interest, I call life, liberty, health, and indolence of body, and the possession of outward things. Okay? Life, liberty, the pursuit. Okay. And then in, in 1693, he wrote, the highest perfection of intellectual nature lies in a careful and constant pursuit of true and solid happiness. Now, I'm, sh I'm sure, I would think, that most of you are aware that in our Constitution, in the beginning, the, the Constitution basically starts this way, with Jefferson, and he, he had written this with Franklin and, and Adams and a couple other guys, but he is primarily responsible for the penning of the Constitution. And he talks about the pursuit that they see an inalienable right to the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's not original thought, is my point. That thought comes from Enlightenment thinkers before them that they treasure. Okay? We hold these truths to be self-evident. That's what they wrote. Okay? The pursuit of happiness. There's a difference between happiness and blessings. Now, I'm going to get into this just a little bit, but you've got to give me a little... You, you pray about this. I say, this is me, all right? This isn't the Word of God, this is me. I say that happiness is a circumstance. Blessing is a condition. Okay? When I say that happiness is a circumstance, how many of you have ever heard of happy hour in a bar? Well, it comes and it goes. It's there momentarily and then it goes. All right? Happy birthday. 
You all heard happy birthday, but it's for a day. It, it's, a, it's a circumstances that comes and goes. It passes, and it's dependent on those outward things. Right? They're flitting and momentary conditions. Constitutional happiness. The American Constitution, when they talk about happiness, it is a self-focused celebration of the human potential apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He is considered, while, while being a good teacher on morals, to be otherwise irrelevant. That's the truth. Now, uh, you know, you, it, it takes a lot of effort to test what I'm saying in these things. Because history is not well taught or known in this day and age. But the data is available. And I will tell you that I have taken an, a very substantial amount of time to study these things. Okay? And I don't say these lightly, but I am saying that, that, that this pursuit of happiness was not a godly thing. Because it was self-focused, self-interest, it was a desire you know, for, for worldly things apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let me just want to, again, yeah. that happiness is a circumstance and blessings are... A condition, a yes. Okay. okay. Now, the Word of God promises... The Constitution is saying, okay, you have the right to go out and pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all right? Mm -hmm. To, you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. First of all, I don't know how you pursue life. Life is life a gift. Is. No, no. Life is a gift from God. Because otherwise you are born you are born in sin, which is separation from God. Right? And then you are walking dead in your transgressions. Life is the gift of God, the Father, as a result of the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. You can you can pursue it. You don't have to pursue it. It's there waiting for you. It is Jesus Christ calling out to you. Come to me, all of you who are weary. All right? Okay? Uh, we are, however, blessings don't come that way. I, I say, okay, that's life. Mm -hmm. Liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Jesus Christ said that if you are a sinner, if you sin, you are a slave to sin. But you are either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Mm -hmm. No government on the face of the earth can give you true liberty. That's a, that's a fact. They can promise it. They will promise it. They always promise it. But the fact is, the only place you will find true liberty is at the foot of the cross. Now, I, I don't want to, I always distract myself, but I will tell you, it's interesting because I had a Skype time this today uh, with some folks over in Leeds, England. And the question, they had contacted me, were asking me questions about the Statue of Liberty. Well, interestingly enough, back uh, in July of 2009, I had done one of the Bible bites, if you're familiar with the Bible bites, mm -hmm. uh, on the Statue of Liberty, because I had I had literally written letters to, to people in the U.S. government or um, when the statue was being restored back in 1986, all right? And I, I just talked about the fact that, you know, you, America can be more free, quote unquote, or provide more civil rights or what have you than another country, and it does. Although, by the way, there are some countries that have as much or not, if not more. But the fact is, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. This nation is a nation of, of slaves. Because this nation is a nation of sinners. All those people who are involved in drugs, in alcohol, in pornography, in greed, those are all things that put you in bondage. And the only things that can break those chains of bondage is the Spirit of God. Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Okay. That deals with the with life, liberty, mm -hmm. and the pursuit of happiness. All right. We're not supposed to be pursuing happiness. Now that doesn't mean God doesn't want you happy, but it's just happy is a circumstance. God doesn't say I'm going to make you happy. He says. My peace I leave with you. Right? God gives us peace. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. It's joy. It's peace. Joy is not subject to circumstance. It's always there. Right? Happy. 
if, if you think I'm getting into this too deep, I'm, I will give you a fair warning. This study is going to be deep. a deep, that's why I say, you know, take notes, or you can write to me by email, office at BibleTalk.com. I'd be happy to mail you my notes as I go ahead and just scratch these things out in, pre, in preparation and preparation. Preparation. Is that a word? It is now. Okay. But I want you to understand, you need to learn this, and we should seek knowledge. That's what it says in Proverbs. The word happy literally came, it meant luck, right? That's where it comes from. It comes from an old English word, hap, which meant chance or fortune. Mm. A lot of people worried about bad luck today because it's Friday the 13th. Oh, Hallelujah. I want to tell you this. No, I am in the, that is a curse from the devil and that God has redeemed me from. I am not subject to that kind of luck. All right. But happiness comes from luck. That's part of the word. Remember haphazard. You heard the word haphazard, yes, right? Yes, yes. All right. It's it. That's where it comes from. Is it connects to that word. It has a sense of being very glad, um, but it also comes from. It's a combination of two words: hap and another old English word, edig, which meant well. You, oh, I know what was the word. Edig. Edig. Oh. Yes, hap and edig. These are two old English words that were conformed or put together to form the word happy. Right? Okay. Okay. And so hap meant luck. And the edig had to do with wealth and riches. So happy had to do by, by luck you you got wealth and riches. Right? Hmm. Blessings. Now in Hebrew, the word for blessing comes from barach. It's literally yeah, you can hear this in a lot of different forms in, in Jewish. We, we pray the, a prayer, um, Baruch Atad Noel Chim Malakalam Baruch. It's to bend, but that literally means to bend the knee, to bow before God. That's where the word blessing comes from. But the English word blessing comes from a word, blood, blood sien, which meant to consecrate or make holy. It almost sounds like blessing. Well, that's where the word, this is yeah, the, this is yeah. the old English word and, and Germanic words that this blessing word comes from. Right. They had to do with consecration and holiness, yes. not luck and wealth. Right. Okay, so while today people may not understand the difference, I want to tell you in its roots it has a very substantial difference. It, that word comes from the consecration and holiness comes from a word, and this is where the word blessing comes from. It has to do with blood. It had to do with the it had to do with the origin of a sprinkling of blood, wow. right? That word was chosen because you know what? Out in the world, you may get luck. Blessing comes from one place and one place only: the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is the font of all blessings. It has nothing to do with chance or good fortune or bad fortune. And that's why it's so important to understand that God is offering, God's desire is to bless us. And when you are walking in the blessings of God, you'll have happiness. More importantly, you'll have joy, unceasing. So when we get into the Beatitudes, we're not talking about, okay, a momentary happiness. We are talking about a condition of blessing and joy. All right? Okay. So let's get into this a little bit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is, this is Matthew 5, 3, the first one, okay, mm -hmm. of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, before getting too deep into that, I want you to consider this fact. I want you to consider the fact that Jesus Christ chose this to be the opening statement of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not random, and it's not an accident. Our God, the God of, the, the God of this world, old devil, it says he's, he is a God of confusion. Our God, Paul says, is not a God of confusion. Our God is a God of good order. Amen. All right? Mm -hmm. So there is purpose in everything that he does. So there is purpose in the structure of what he speaks. Nothing is accidental with God. So why does he choose this particular, you know, why, let, why don't we start with something else? I mean, you know, is it just random that it starts with this? 
you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. I, I don't think that it's random at all. I am a literalist. I think that the Word of God is pure and holy, and every, every dot and tittle has purpose. And this is why I am so concerned about the Word being changed. Paul, as I said, wrote and said that God is not a God of confusion. Our God is a God of good order. Sometime back I did, a, I did a teaching, which by the way is available on the Bible Talk site, on ownership, stewardship, and possession. The, the three states of stuff. Okay? Now here's what's important about this and why Jesus opened with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It. I'm talking about the things of the world. It. Whatever it may be. I'm talking about your house, your car, your kitty cats and puppy, whatever it is, is not yours. Now you might want to write this down. Because if you've ever heard anything important, brother, you just heard something important. Nothing that exists in this planet is yours. You have no ownership in spite of what the world tells you. Psalm 24 verse 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. King James says the fullness thereof. Everything in the world. It says, let me just read it. The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. The world and all those who dwell in it. Everything belongs to God. He did not give away ownership when he turned over, you know, dominion to Adam. He gave stewardship and possession to Adam and Eve and mankind, but he didn't transfer ownership. Nothing that you have is yours. Being poor in spirit is about establishing the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your heart. I'll say that one more time. Say that one more time. Being poor in spirit, it's not about what you have or don't have. It's about what you consider to be your own. Right? Being poor in spirit is about establishing the lordship of Jesus Christ in your heart. That everything that you have, everything that you are, it says you're not your own, you were purchased with a price. Everything that you own, everything that you have, belongs to him. He may give you possession of it, and he may give you stewardship over it, but it belongs to him. He is Lord. And if you don't understand that fact, that it all belongs to him, and therefore he has authority over it all, which even the unsaved saw after the end of the Sermon on the Mount, then you will not get, you will not understand, and you will not be blessed by the words of Jesus Christ on the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. Okay? All right. Now, that being said, I want to tell you that in the scriptures there seems to be a bias towards the less affluent. All right? Because there seems to be a clear and present danger to riches. Now that's not what you're going to hear in an awful lot of churches today. And I promise you it is not what you're going to hear in the biggest and fastest growing churches. I have had not only have I heard people say, not only have I had people come up to me and say, quote unquote, God wants you rich. I have had people come to me as a pastor, as a preacher, and say that I was an ungodly person because I refused to go around and preach that very same thing. Now, that's because most, of, most people don't understand what riches are, right? But I just, I want to do this. I want to start by reading you some scriptures that are really, really important. Remember, this is a Bible study. What's more important than what I have to say is what the Word of God has Amen. to say. That's right. In Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, it says this. Two things I ask of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I may not be full and deny you and say, who is Lord? When you get rich, there's a, there's a clear danger that you will forget God. If you don't believe that, 
look at history and see if that's not been the case over and over and over. Because what happens is people become, they begin to trust in their riches. They become dependent on their own money. They don't need to turn to God to provide. They can just reach in their pants pocket and pull it out. They don't need God. And that is a great, great danger. And money is a tool. Listen, first, first of all, let me make sure that we are on the same page here. That doesn't mean you can't be a Christian and be rich. The great desire is, the great problem is in the desire for riches. Right? Remember, Paul wrote that it is the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil. He, the, the Word of God does not say that the love of money is, is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that. It says that the love, the, it doesn't say that money, or rather, I hear that all the time, money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that at all. It says that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Okay? So it is this greed in a person's heart that will lead them astray, because greed is idolatry. And the Word says, be on your guard against every form of greed. Right? And greed will never, money will never satisfy you when you have greed, by the way. It says the leech has three daughters. Give, give, give. It says in Ecclesiastes that those who love silver and gold will never be satisfied with silver and gold. There's so much about money, in, about money in there. But here, and I'm, I'm picking a few sample verses. In 1 Timothy 6 9, it says, But those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. When you're poor in spirit and you don't claim that anything is your own, you get to a place where you are free to understand what Paul said when he wrote to the, to the Philippians and said, My God shall supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You don't need to supply all of your own needs. He'll take care of it. That's a promise. How many Christians do you know actually act like that? Like he is going to supply your needs. You don't have to, you, why do you, how could Jesus possibly turn around and say to you, and he is saying this to you, be anxious for nothing? What's the matter? Isn't he reading the Financial Times? Doesn't he get Bloomberg? What's the matter with God? Doesn't he know what's going on in the world? Absolutely. It's a disaster out here. You want to know something? It is a disaster out there. It is not a disaster in here. Peace that passes because understanding. the peace that passes understanding, the peace of God reigns in my heart because I trust that he will supply my needs through his riches, through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He doesn't have to supply me with riches to take care of needs. He's got the riches. This is, I mean, listen, if ever there was a time when you need to get a hold of this truth, it's now. It is now. Because the economy, oh, uh, yeah, I know. Listen, I turn in the news to all oh, social wars, it's all going to get better. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I know I've, I've shared this with a lot of you. I, I, have, I have a number of friends who are uh, very influential financial counselors, very good, faithful brothers in the Lord, all right? But very astute financial counselors, they represent a lot of people with a lot of money. And um, sometime back, Alice and I were over in Sarasota, Florida, and we were having a lunch meeting with a group of these folks. And a dear brother, Gary Moore, uh, Gary's a, just a, a great guy, loves the Lord, and I'll tell you what, his knowledge of financial things is mind-boggling, right? Um, and we were having a conversation at the, at the lunch table, and he said to me, somehow he said to me, well, you know, the world says money talks. I said, yeah, I know. I said, Jesus agreed with him. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, what? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, Jesus says that money talks. He just says, it lies. That's why he said, beware the deceitfulness of riches. Money will make promises to you that it can't keep. Not at all. Mm -hmm. God never will. He watches over his word to perform it. So, now, why is this such an important thing? Because the error is so widely preached yes. by those who, and this is Titus, Paul writing to Titus, mm -hmm. by those who are upsetting whole families, teaching things that they should not, they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. There are a lot of people out there teaching things so that they can get sordid gain. This past Sunday, well, at our services, I was talking about the fact, um, if you look at Gehazi, Elisha's servant, 
in the time of Naaman the leper, when, when Elisha refused to take anything, refused, he would not take anything from Naaman, although God used him in this miraculous, incredible healing of Naaman's leprosy. Remember, that's an incurable disease. And Naaman wanted to, wanted to just shower gifts upon Elisha for this, and Elisha refused. He wasn't going to, but Gehazi chased him. Elisha's servant chased him down and basically demanded and took money. When he got back, Elisha said, you know what? He said, Naaman's leprosy will fall on you. And it did. Because Gehazi believed that you could sell the blessings of God. Simon the magician in the book of Acts, when he saw the power, now he, people thought that this man had the great power of God. He was a magician. And magic is the imitation of power. It's not the real deal. It's done by smoke and mirrors and deception. All right. When he saw the real thing in the apostles, he went to them and he wanted to he wanted to get that, and he said he would pay them for that. So he, on the other hand, unlike Gehazi, Gehazi thought you could sell the blessings of God. Simon the magician thought you could buy the blessings of God. And if you turn on randomly turn on almost any Christian television station in the United States, England, or Africa that I know of, you're going to hear a lot of preachers preaching exactly that. You're going to hear because a lot of Gehazis. You're going to hear a lot of Gehazis Simon and a lot of Simons. That's right. People who think you can buy and sell the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. Repent. But that's being preached all over. It is being preached. I, it's incredible. As a matter of fact, I was reading in the news this morning because I follow a lot of news about what's going on in the church around the world. And some of the fastest growing churches in the world, and this makes sense to me, are in persecuted areas. So, and you know, we, we have a lot of, we have a lot of heart for Africa. I've preached in Africa. Um, and in Africa right now, so there are, the fastest growing church in the world right now is based in Nigeria. It's a prosperity preaching church denomination. In Uganda, they were talking about how so many people are being damaged because they're being defrauded by preachers who are getting rich by demanding payments sorted for the gain. miracles for sordid gain. It's truly, truly unfortunate what's going on. But it's, you know what? It is written. It's written. Exactly. It has to be. But you, be on guard. Be on guard for, your, guard for yourself. Be on guard for those you love and care for. The blessings of God are not to be bought or sold. Yes, you sh should you tithe and give offerings. Oh, hey, I think that generosity shouldn't even be a topic of discussion. It's just you be your nature. It's to give. It's more blessed. Because, be, be, yes, because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is the nature of God to give. If it were not the nature of God to give, we would not be sitting here joined together across the internet tonight. Because the Word of God, it all starts with this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. If it were not for that free gift of God, we would be doomed for all eternity. And having that Holy Spirit dwelling within us, having the mind of Christ that we're supposed to have, giving should be our nature. Yes. So why do all these preachers have to force it out of people and squeeze it out of people and promise them, you know, go listen to that, that teaching I told you about, about ownership, stewardship, and possession. And, and hear some of that stuff. Even if you didn't hear it before, Listen to it again. It Never hurts to hear it again. Listen, it's really good. Okay. All right. So, anyhow, let me just say this again. Before we get into this a little more deeply, having riches is not the problem. The desire for riches is what the problem is and where the danger lies. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. All right? Is that all right with you? Yes, it is. Okay, then... Well, dash right I, along. It just made me think about the, um, the thing that's going now around with the publisher's clearinghouse. Uh -huh. And how alluring that is, you know, to, to, to the, the ads on television trying to, you know, suck you in on this. I, I uh, am not a fan of lotteries and, and gambling, and mm -hmm. I just. You know, it's people reaching out in hope for, for something 
when the promise of God is there. And if you're, if you're trusting in God, believing in God, and trusting that in his lordship of your life, that he is the one to determine what you should have, what you shouldn't have, then you'll have peace. So it troubles me to see the move, the ongoing, the move that's taking place right now in so many states in the United States of America where they're trying to legalize even greater uh, gambling just to stimulate revenue for them. It's, it's, it's a troubling thing to me. But by the way, that's not something new. No. I want you to know that there were lotteries in the United States of America. Even, well, George Washington. In, in Washington's time. I mean, they, they funded projects. Uh, they funded the part of the revolution yeah. with, with, re with gambling. I mean, that's called what it is, with, with gambling. Uh, and I've, I've heard people talk about, particularly as all the debates rage now about gambling casinos being built here in Florida and up in, you know, in New York, not on Indian reservations, by the way. And I've heard people say, well, this is just a form of tax on the poor. Well, I know something, that's right. I mean, go watch who does most of that gambling, gives, you know, gambles away what they don't have, what they can't afford to gamble away. Okay. My goodness gracious. The purpose of this study, again, is to see the relevance of Christ's teaching in our lives. Your life, my life, Alice's life, every one of you out there. That we understand that the words of the Sermon on the Mount spoken 2,000 years ago are ever so relevant in our lives today. And they are about a way to blessings, to find the fullness of God's blessings in our life that are so completely opposite of the world's ways. And we need to be a church, we need to be a body that has turned away from the world and turned to the Word to live and dwell in the fullness of God's blessings. Because it is His desire that you be blessed. But again, that blessing is not about, oh, a giggly smile on your face. It is about a joy inside of you, a peace inside of you, that none of the events going on in the world can touch. None of the events going on in your own personal life, in your home, in your house, in your job, you know. You can't be shaken. No, you got to be, that's why, Sickness. I mean, people like David say, you know, the, the mountains move into the sea, the earth shakes and the mountains move. I shall not be moved. We have to have that steadfastness. And the only place that steadfastness will come from is by abiding in the Word and knowing the truth. Remember, Jesus talked about the deceitfulness of riches. The world is out there lying. And it's heightened in this particular season with all of the promises being made. But the Word of God is true. Okay, And that's why you need to get this Word of God stirred up in your heart. And understand that you need to test the, the translations that you're using, what's going on out there. Because what the devil is doing now, for the first time, I'm mean, really the first time, um, and I, I've seen this happen in the last three and a half decades, is that the Word of God is being changed. Nobody had the audacity to make the changes in the Word of God that are taking Chutzpah. place today. Chutzpah, yes. Get a little Yiddish in here. Yes. So, uh, just let me say this, trust in God. Trust in the Lord. Know that God's desire is that you be blessed, you be blessed, you be blessed, you be blessed, you be blessed. And here is his method for you being blessed, blessed, blessed. That you be poor in spirit, knowing that all that you need belongs to God, and God is a giver. God doesn't need what you have, but I promise you that you need what he has. And his desire is... Come and drink without cost, he said. So beware of the wolves in sheep's clothing out there that are trying to sell you the blessings of God. All right, well, uh, I've gone and done it again. Well, we almost got into the first verse. That went fast. Yeah. We will get where God wants us to be each and every week in this study. Yes. And again, it's not about seeing how fast we can get through or finding verses that you like the best. It is about seeing Jesus Christ more clearly. And to my brother Mark, who couldn't be with us tonight, yes. 
Bless you, my brother, and I hope you'll be here with us again next Friday night. And until then, may the Lord our God just bless us all. Give us greater and greater understanding of the revelation that he's provided through his son, Jesus Christ. May we grow in his word and ever be more like him and share that love with everybody we meet in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you until next time.